I'm glad you're here. I'm Kim Taylor, and I've been the art teacher at St. Andrews for 19 years, came in first and fourth, but I've had a 32-year association with the school. So my children came here, I was in the spot of determining what preschool <laughs> that I was going to choose, and um, so I feel like I made a choice in being here and being part of this wonderful community and family. Um, so, when I came in, I said I'm going to shake up the art department. I had my own vision of what I was going to do and the type of art that I wanted to teach. And I feel that the art exemplifies the way that St. Andrews approaches learning. Uh, and one of the reasons I chose this for my school, it's problem solving and it's critical thinking. And, um, it wasn't just wrote. It was a lot of creativity that goes on from the earliest age. And I think um, I use a discipline-based art curriculum, which includes production, history, aesthetics, and uh, criticism. And throughout the years, I have said more and more that the criticism, which is what you guys are going to do today, is probably the most important thing that I do. Uh, it's not the product. It's not that a child has the best bunny or uh, at the end of, it's the process. And today, what I have planned for you guys <laughs> is uh, a criticism. This is the type, this is a lesson that I used in second grade. I've used it more than once. <laughs> you are going to be my class. And you're going to see exactly what happens in a second grade criticism. And if we have time, what I'm hoping is, if we get to a certain point, this usually in second grade takes a whole hour, and they're not ready to stop. Once their minds start clicking, they want to share, everybody wants to share what they think, what they feel. So I want all of you to take a deep breath and not be intimidated by having to state an opinion on art. What I tell the children first when we're looking at criticism, there are no right or wrong answers. As long as you can validate or tell me why you think that. Like, oh, I think it's pretty. Why do you think it's pretty? I like the colors. Why do, we, why do you like the colors? And also, you're going to find that um, it's much harder for adults to be as open and honest as children are with what they say. You've had years and years of, am I going to say something wrong? Is my, my opinion not going to be right? They don't, they don't feel like that. You know, they really express themselves in a totally honest way. And this is a place that they really do have the freedom to be expressive. And that's one thing about art that I love. I've told you there are multiple solutions to problems. It's not just having to give back the fact. It's the fact that they can solve this in a number of ways. So, this is, I'm going to pretty much go about it. I'm going to try not to talk up to you. I'm going to try to keep it pretty much the way we would approach it. And I, this is a participatory event. So all of you, you're going to be asked questions. I don't want to have to call on you. <laughs> I'm going to want you to, you know, raise your hand and express an opinion. And this is the first time I've used this. So it's just the arrow, the up arrow, this one on the right. Phrase, talk, three surrealism. Salvador Dali, Rene Marie, and Joan Moreau. Yes. Surrealism is an art movement that shows real objects in an unreal setting. Surrealists distort real images. 
and surrealists often paint dream images or images from the artist's subconscious mind. They might think you too. You're the class that. Okay. Let's see. Lily. No. Could you come to the front of the room? Okay. Class, I want you to imagine I am going to paint a picture of Lillian. Okay, Lillian, I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to do it in photorealism. Okay? I'm going to paint every freckle, every hair. She is going to look exactly the way she is. Okay, on this finger, I am going to paint a 2,000 pound African elephant that Lillian is balancing. This African elephant is playing a tuba. Okay, put your arm on the side, Lillian. Oh, this other arm. We still have the elephant up here. In this hand, I'm going to paint a 200 pound cheeseburger. That is surrealism. Everything's done realistically, and yet you know you're thinking outside. I usually have the smallest child in the class. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and have any of you, when you dream, have you ever dreamed you could fly? No, I mean, I've dreamed I could fly. I remember when I was a kid, I used to take off running, and before long, I was soaring over the trees. If you painted that, that would be definitely a type of surrealism. And the other, and really in, um, in Dali and in Marguerite, we're going to see a good bit of realism used and distorted images. In Moreau, I think what you see is more of a dreamlike quality. Uh, and that's what I hope you get a time, that we have time for you guys to do an art project. But it's something is almost a bird, but not quite a bird. It's almost in your mind you think, is it a fish? You know, or, or is it not? So you go through and you look at the images and anybody have any questions about surrealism, what it is? This is my favorite surrealist, Salvador Dali. 1904 to 1989. Salvador Flamenco Felipe Jacinto Dali y Domenech was born in Fogueras, Catalonia, Spain. He's known for his striking, bizarre images in his surrealistic art. His best known work, The Persistence of Memory, was completed in 1930. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Dali. Very unusual character in that um, he had a brother that died nine months before he was born. And so his parents said that he was the reincarnation of his brother. This, can you imagine growing up when they would say, you don't like peas? Salvador liked peas. Because his brother was named exactly the same thing. And, and this really had a, a major effect on his perception of reality. You know, it's always, he was always feeling like he was his brother. Uh, he was a, a student that got hysterical about, there's an ant on my chair, you know, and the rest of the class would go, you know, oh, that's just Dolly, you know, he's doing it again. Uh, and he was always just being outrageous. He said he received messages from outer space through his mustache. Um, once he was invited to a Hollywood uh, party and he arrived in a limousine full of cabbages. He showed up at a party in a scuba suit. Uh, he really liked to shock people. So, uh, and a lot of it I feel like he really went out of his way to be outrageous. Uh, so, his childhood, his mother died when he was very young. He was raised by a nanny. This is a, a picture of a, a very familiar setting of Spain, Catalonia, where he was raised. All right. Class, would 
anyone like to give me an idea of what they think the picture of the nanny might be? Be open. Like say, no wrong answers. Like what? The picture. This is this That's is the nanny. nanny. Oh, I just didn't hear the last thing. Which is oh, that. what do you what do you think that might stand for? Well, there's a hole in the middle, which means there must be a feeling of emptiness associated with the nanny, who's being propped up, which to me looks like a, an old cane that an older person might use, which could represent maybe something to do with his family, maybe, I don't know, his old self, because you know, he was given a new identity. His, his mother's death uh, uh, had a really big effect on him. You know, it was, it was very hard for him. Does anybody else want to talk the weaning of furniture? Anybody have an idea what they think that might mean? Jessica? Sorry. Do you have an idea what you think that might mean? Weaning of furniture? Not at this particular moment. Well, I'm not going to. Um, he uses a lot of crunches, so look for these. You know, a, a lot of times in Donnie's work, um, the crutch is kind of going to say what a crutch does. It holds us up, you know. It, um, it's a support. It, so, but you're going to see a lot of those. And the weaning of furniture, you know, it, and it can be anything. I have no idea if, if my opinion is right. I've read things that he says this is symbolic of this and this is symbolic of that. But, you know, I, I would just think kind of displacement or something to do with that. But, like I said, I'm, I'm talking to you like an adult. For me, the crutch, it's, I've seen it a few times in his work, but it's, it's an artificial support. And I guess to me, it seems like the nanny, and coupling that with the artificial support makes it feel like perhaps she's artificial. She's kind of a replacement. Um, that he needs this artificial support to fill this hole uh, that was left by the little house. The hole definitely is loss. Okay, we talk, I, I mentioned this just a little bit ago. Who wants to guess what the name of this is? His most famous work? Persistence in memory. Persistence in memory. But isn't there a persistence in time, too? Is it too uh, painted? Some of these artists work in series. He has a few more uh, paintings like this. Uh, who would like to give their idea of what could those floppy watches make? Well, the, the, the white object uh, um, on the ground looks like a closed eye with eyelashes. So I'm guessing that that might be um, representative of sleep, which um, maybe the melted clocks is kind of like time standing still for him. Um, maybe he's dreaming of the perfect life for himself. There is another painting that I look at that has this kind of blanket, drapey sleep, which is called sleep. Persistence of memory. And once again, he repeats the, the background is where he lives. It's something that he's very familiar with. Now, the, ki the children, uh, they talk about, you know, time, and they usually get what it really is about. Believe it or not, it's about Einstein's theory of uh, relativity and time not being a definite spot a definite thing like a clock on a wine the time is very flexible almost like folding time or uh, the time becomes more uh, uh, you know, three-dimensional rather than a static thing which is actually what he means children do not uh, relate to that but they definitely see it as as time just being very creepy and not a, not a hard thing Any comments on others on this one? All right, this is something I always say. How does this make you feel? 
lonely. It's very lonely and desolate. It is a desolate landscape. Unsettled. Yeah, because it's not, it's out of our normal um, image. And children, they respond, they respond a lot to these um, the backgrounds, landscapes. Sometimes we just talk about how do you think this works as far as visual for you? You know, not, I don't want to say that. You know, how, do you, how do you think that the artist has used the paint and the technique to, you know, the way he paints this to achieve this? Good job, or as far as we look at, we talk about all this. Unfortunately, your children already have studied the principles of design and the elements of art by the time they've seen this. So they know a little bit about balance. And we talk about asymmetrical balance and symmetrical balance. And I tell them, people, the, the, the all parents, and the reason we do this in first grade is so we'll have a vocabulary to talk about this. Because they actually can look at something and say, oh, I like the texture, because they know what texture is. So in a way, they may be equipped with more um, critical tools than you do. Or maybe you need to have these, this alarm on. But they do. <laughs> they've had, they've reviewed this, this type of thing. Because I mean, all right, now, I thought, do the parents need to see this? <laughs> the children see this. All right, this is called premonition of civil war. First question I ask the children, what is, what is civil war? What is a civil war? No wrong answer. You know, you have a division among the same group. Yes, division among the same group, the same country. Now, the reason that this was done, the children get this that we, you know, we talked about the Civil War in the United States was a war within the country and also what was going on in Salvador Dali's life was that there was a civil war going on in Spain. Uh, the children have all seen Guernica. We talk about Guernica in first grade, which is probably one of the most powerful anti-war paintings that's ever done. I was just telling um, Rachel that I see the print of that and, and I'm proud. You know, but this particular painting, you just walked in on the most graphic painting. Ever painted. <laughs> All right, so, so, so class, what does this say when you look at this? How do you, how does this make you feel about war? How does this make you feel? Death. No wrong answer. It's pretty grotesque. It's grotesque. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, would would you call it uh, violent? It's violent because violent. you have a monster that's coming in that's splitting one body. And the split. Mm -hmm. Kids get this. That this is one person. This, you don't have somebody on this side shooting at another person on this side. What you have here is, a, you know, a country being torn apart by war, which makes, and children, they understand this image, and they don't really, I have never anyone, any of the children go, <laughs> we say, what is civil war? Uh, I get a little, how does it make you feel? It makes me feel bad. You know, that war is bad. That war is something that tears people apart. And um, it's a very honest response from from children. This this is probably going to be the most disquieting image that you will see, but really I found, um, to me, even after Guernica, which may not be quite as graphic as this, but the image of, of an anti-war type statement that the children, uh, they, they understand. Okay. Dolly later on in his life, uh, you know, he was born Catholic, but he became more and more uh, into his religion, you know, in his later years. And um, 
one interesting thing. He actually had a room in his house built that had a glass floor. And he would use it for parties and different things. But one of the things, the reasons he had this glass floor, he could go underneath and study perspective. <laughs> I'm right. I want to tell you, the kids love this. Can I have a comment? How does this make you feel? Ascension. Lillian looked like she was afraid I was going to call her. <laughs> Tim, how does it make you feel? Uh, maybe a little bit disoriented. <laughs> okay. It's not an angle that we're used to looking at. What do you think is the theme of the grid is smoke? But the kids definitely picked this up as an anti-smoking painting. Time transfixed. Uh, the surrealists were really into science. And a lot of the new scientific things that Einstein was throwing out, they were using in their art to make statements about new scientific theories. But uh, 1932, when you look at these timelines and what's going on too, it's sometimes surprising. I always tell the children, um, when I show them an Impressionist piece, that is just so everyday to them. But Monet, that we're doing in second grade now, right now, that was outrageous. You know, Monet was outrageous. He was shunned. He was not let into the salon because they thought his work was terrible. And our children have been exposed to so many images that these things are no longer um, outrageous to them. So a lot of things that they look at, I have no idea what this means. <laughs> <laughs> as far as goal conduct, don't you sometimes think you get an idea from the title? I always read the titles when I'm trying to interpret. I, it's raining. Businessman. Man. 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 Okay, Becky, you got it. It means not what? It, it's not a positive. Seeing the world is becoming a duplication. You know, people, it's the same thing, repeated. Uh, business, law, you know, paper, you know, cutouts, and they're just falling from the sky, inundated with uh, the industrial and the business in, in the world. So this image and the kids, they, they love it. And, and this is one, you know, I usually guide them into. Uh, do you think people would all look alike? You know, should they look alike? You know? Well, that's the same <laughs> They love this one. <laughs> all right, kids. Do you think that these two people are close? Call the lovers. I'm going to check them. Oh, they are not close. Oh, the, one of the funniest answers that I got to this is one little boy said um, they put bags over their heads because they weren't cute. <laughs> but uh, most of them understand that they're, he's uh, saying this relationship, you can't have this separation, even though they're calling these people close. That the bags are saying they're not. They can't see each other. Uh, they are um, in a very um, with you intimate. A kiss would be something. If your mom kisses you, you know that this is a close or a loving thing. But if your mom kissed you through a bag, would you feel the same way? If, if she put something between you to express this kind of emotion. I think it makes Josie like a cell phone. <laughs> you know, relationships and what do we put between ourselves that keep us from truly being close to each other. Um, this is just, I'm not, not going to take long on this one. He did a, this particular artist painted in series, so he would do uh, the Mysteries of the Horizon. I always just relate this to gameplay, but he did a, 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 just a whole series of paintings that are more 
just about perspective. But, um, all right, I've gotten some interesting responses from children. What do you think is the number one response that I get when I show them this apple? How does this make you feel? had some children that say that. The number one response from children is hungry. <laughs> the, the listening room. Uh, I, I did have one little boy, I loved it. He said it made him feel like he was like closed in and trapped, that he couldn't move. And he was saying it made him feel claustrophobic without knowing it, but you know the number one, how do you feel about this? They like this, some children will say, it reminds me of a castle. Um, you know, if we look at his title, The Listening Room, we might feel like, that, are we really listening if it's all filled up with one big thing, a big apple? He uses a lot of apples. I'm really not sure if the symbolism goes back to our Christian <coughs> apple. But the Son of Man, he did a whole series once again with a man sometimes. And the children always say the dove stands for peace. Mm -hmm. to them. This, the Son of Man. Um, I, I, I've had one or two that know the story of William Tell, like shooting the apple off the head. And, but that's not very often. But be thinking about what you think these mean. Like I said, this usually takes a full hour. The human condition, and you have to look really closely at this. This is one you can spend a lot of time. Um, it's an artist covering the real landscape with a painting of the landscape. So if you can kind of see, so you really can't see what he's painting. <coughs> Yeah, the easel in front of the window. So it's like an image within an image. But you can think of a lot of things in that. He did a whole series of bottles. And the kids love these. The sky and the bottle and the clouds are the dreams. Okay, John Moreau, how are we doing? Are we Yes, Moreau is um, more into symbolism at the end of his life, not really looking at the image. The image is not the most important thing. He was very precocious. By the time he was seven, he was sent to art school. I think some of his art, uh, they went back and dug up things that he did when he was eight years old that are considered valuable now, very, um, and probably the most, the smile of the flamboyant queen. And when the kids go with these, they just go everywhere. They are all over the spectrum with what they see. And I just let them go with it. You know, um, I think it's a kite. I think it's a blanket. I think uh, it's a star. It's an arrow. It's um, a bird. It's a, it's a face. A man with a mustache. So with these images that are so abstracted, you know, he might have had something particular in mind, but I just let them, and they love to take these apart with what I see. Woman and bird in the night. And this is, really, Moreau is the one that could do a project related to surrealism with the second graders. I was hoping you'd have time to do it. The singing fish. And I, don't, I really, a lot of times, um, have taken the titles out of these. I like to not even really give them a clue <laughs> and let them just really think their way through it and take it apart. They love the color in these, they love the shapes, and we talk about organic and <coughs> geometrical shapes and line, which are elements of art. What kind of color schemes? Are they warm? Are they cool? Um, how is the artist using these? And this is one of their favorite, Harlequin's Carnival because there are so many little things that they get to find. They find a lion tamer. 
they find uh, the clown, the you know, someone on a bicycle, um, the ringmaster, we, uh, the people on the trapeze. They, they will spend 10 minutes just finding things in there as a class. And they are very eager, even the quietest child wants to share. They, they get really visually into looking at this. These are kind of concrete images. <laughs> now, do they have time to do? Anybody who wants to say as long as you Well, have time. Um, just I have 15 minutes, but what I was going to say, if you have a little time, I have an art project for you. Okay. And this is usually what they do, and this is fun. Oh, <coughs> Betsy didn't come in. Marsha, you want to be my assistant? Give everybody a this. this. I do this with the students. They hand out things, they pick up things. They, they will work themselves to death for a little pink ticket. <laughs> okay. Guys, this is a project that I came up with. And The, I, this is one of those projects that everybody is successful. Every child, I don't have anybody that goes, oh. and right. On the top line, you're given six visual images. Visual means you can see it. And an element, I think it's visual elements, and an element is a basic part of something. So, on the sheet it says do as many images as you can. I have the children do 10. And this is second grade. When you're doing from line A, you can only use line A. But then after you do 10 from line A, you go to line B. You can combine these in any way you want. You can do a little short symbol. You can use a big symbol. Like, uh, if I was going to... But you cannot modify the symbol. You can't change it in any way. Because what I found, if you let them start changing it, they're not as creative. Because if they can make up their own thing, they're not having to think about, um, let's just say, if I was going to add this symbol to the bottom of this. And you have to do everything exactly the same. They, and a lot of kids will go, okay, you know, this is cowboy. They, they, so what they try to do is like Moreau, it's not exact, but to them they create fish, they create cars. Or it doesn't have to be anything at all. Like if you wanted to use... I tell you know just a little boot thing and go around and around. Now, what I tell them, they have to use at least three symbols. So of the elements that are there, you have to use at least three in every one. But if they want to use 20, they can. I've had children who take a whole page and they combine those elements to make some far out thing. So try, sit down, and I want each of you to make just a few. Uh, you know, like the, the way you put it together, any way you want. As long as you reproduce the image, you can use three of those. You can come down with a, one of these. You know, you can do anything you want with those. And it could go to that. <laughs> and it can almost be anything. And this is real. They love this project. They have so much fun just coming up with different combinations of these elements, whether they're small or large. And when we get through, I have them pick their favorite one, and we put it in the middle of a big little piece of paper, and then they do it in primary colors the way that Miro would. They're going to use mainly uh, you know, red, yellow, blue, and some black. And then I let them surround the large image with 
say, four or five of the smaller images. But you cannot mix the elements in A and B. You can only use the elements in A together to create something, and then you can only use the elements in B to create. You're the best class I've ever had. We're really trying, huh? Well, no, <laughs> quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, you know, they're like, hey, look at mine. Uh, this is dog. I've done a spaceship. Can I do a car? Um, or, uh, you know, a lot of children are so into narrative. As they're doing this, they're coming up with stories, uh, you know, different kind of... Um, this jet is taking off and it's going to go to this planet. So they might take several and combine these to create uh, a storyline. And really, uh, when they come back, they can color them any way that they want. And the one thing that I really love about this project is everybody's combination of elements is different. So nobody's going to really, as you go around, theirs are great, but they don't look like the person you know, next to them. I'm going to have to go look, see what kind of critters you're coming up with. Yeah. Oh, look, hair, cool. <laughs> That's it. A long time ago, I made the decision never to talk down to the children. Um, if they don't understand, I encourage everybody, but I feel like they have such potential, and uh, I want to always for it to art to be challenging. You maybe can tell I include in my art classes math, history, language, music, creative writing, I was trying to think of all the disciplines. I found art to be a natural curriculum connector. And uh, I love to write, so if we can write a synchrone or a, a little short story when we create a ghost house or write a story about a monster, I try to encourage uh, creative writing a lot. And I love science, so if I can put science into a lesson, I definitely include science. Uh, whether it's my natural science, which is probably more. Thank you. Juan, glad you came. Uh, Polynesian art, we might look at continental drift. We might look at how the Polynesian islands were formed. We'll talk about lava, lava and mag magma, and we will. Um, look at Thor Heyerdahl's Kentucky and how those islands became populated, uh, how plant life, <laughs> anything that I can do. And then we'll do a hula and we'll do some Polynesian art and talk about line, structure, color, composition. And I also uh, try to do a lot of uh, global studies. Uh, I have been very fortunate in my life to have traveled a good bit. And the school is sending me to India next year. Oh, wow. But I'm, I've been China, Japan, England several times, South America, Italy, yeah, everywhere. And I love to travel and I find every time I go someplace, it expands me as a person and also expands my classroom, the art, and so.
So I did a lot of Indian projects last year, and after going to China, we did a lot of Chinese projects, but I, I include China almost every year, and Japan almost every year. Um, last year, I had my Iranian uh, parents. Uh, I learned about Nelruz, which I had never heard of. So the children did a project on an ancient Zoroastrian holiday. So he gave me an opportunity to learn about that. One of the oldest holidays celebrated all over the world, and I had never heard of it. <laughs> so I'm also a student. I love having new. I was going to say, guys, I am going to, I have class in five minutes, so, so I'm going to leave you do, guys do it all. You can stay here as long as you would like, but you want to play with this, and I'll bring you some markers. <laughs> Thank you. But I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did, did all of you know that Chelsea was my daughter? So, but she did one. I'm Miss Payne. She, yeah, she started here in pre-K and yeah. came through. Oh, wow! Yeah. I didn't know that. I enjoyed her presentation very much. Seems like a lot of you were here. But thank you. Like, uh, third grade, we're mask making. We did the history of masks, looking at ancient Neolithic masks, seven thousand years old, Iranian masks. Chinese theater mask, Greek mask, whatever. And now they're having to create an art mask, and none of them can do the same thing. So it's stretching them. I have masks that are, have um, Lego masks, but they're, you know, and they have to be collage. So this is going to be, I can hardly wait to see what they come up with after having their history of mask making. But come to the art movie anytime. Thank you. Bye bye.